Hello, hello, hello. Peace, 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 and power and elevation be to all. This your girl Tiffany coming through here live in the vet. Today's topic I want to get into uh black history. So I am going to be talking about Kelly Miller. So Kelly Miller was a scientist, but he had multiple titles. He was a math mathematician, he was a sociologist, he was a, a essayist. And he was a, a columnist and he was also a activist. So he had multiple titles. Peace, Chauncey. How you doing? Peace to you, brother Chauncey. So he had multiple titles that he uh, had under his name. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to be talking about him and talking about his legacy and his history. So I want to give a shout out to everybody that's been subscribing to the channel. Thank you guys. For those of you that's been watching, thank you. And for those that's been sharing the videos, I appreciate that as well. So, you know, hopefully I can get more subscribers, but you know, that's going to be in the near future. But for right now, I'm satisfied with what I have right at the moment. So let me go ahead and get started on um, Kelly Miller. So I like doing these things because I think that it's very important for us to really like get more active like knowing more about our history and how it has uh played a role in our current situation but also just knowing especially what our ancestors have done in this country and abroad and how they played their roles and how they opened up doors of opportunity for us and i think we tend to forget that a lot so i'm gonna go ahead and get started hopefully you guys can see my screen Okay, so anyways, um, this is Kelly Miller. As you can see, that's the statue they have of him right here, this little statue. So Kelly Miller was born on July 18th of 1863. And he was, and he died on December 29th, 1939. He was an American mathematician, sociologist, essayist, a newspaper col columnist, author, and an important figure in the intellectual life of Black America for close to half a century. He was known as the Bard of the pot Potomac, the Bard of, of the Potomac, excuse me. I'm over here trying to clean my glasses. But anyways, it says his early life, uh, Kelly Miller was the sixth of ten children born to elizabeth miller and kelly miller senior his mother was a former slave and his father was a free black man who was conscripted into the winsboro regiment of the confederate army miller was born in winsboro south carolina where he would attend local primary and grade school from 1878 to 1880, Miller attended the Fairfield Institute based on his achievements. He was offered a scholarship to Howard University, a historically black college. Miller finished the preparatory department's three-year curriculum in Latin and Greek, then mathematics in two years. After finishing one department, he quickly moved on to the next one. Miller attended the college department at Howard from 1882 to 1886. Now, this is a photo of him right here. That's a photo. All right. From 18, excuse me, in 1886, Miller was given the opportunity to study advanced mathematics with Captain Edgar Frisbee. Frisbee was an English mathematician working at the U.S. Naval Observatory. Frisbee assistant Simon Newcomb noticed Miller's intellectual talent and recommended that he study at Johns Hopkins University. Miller spent the following two years at Johns Hopkins University and became the first African-American student to attend the university. Miller studied mathematics, physics, and astronomy. He was the first African-American to study graduate mathematics in the United States. And he was also a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. All right, so Miller was not able to keep attending John 
Johns Hopkins University due to financial limitations. From 1889 to 1890, taught mathematics at the M Street High School in Washington, D.C. Appointed professor of mathematics at Howard in 1890, Miller introduced sociology, the development development structure and functioning of human society into the curriculum in 1895, serving as professor of sociology from 1895 to 1934. Miller graduated from Howard University School of Law in, 19, I mean, in 1903. In 1903, Miller was appointed dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. His deanship lasted 12 years, and in that time, the college changed significantly. The old classical curriculum was modernized and new courses in the natural sciences and the social sciences were added. Miller was an avid support, supporter of Howard University and actively recruited students to the school. In 1914, he planned a Negro American Museum and Library. He persuaded Jesse E. Moreland to donate his large private library on Blacks in Africa and the United States to Howard University and it became the foundation for his Negro Americana Museum and Library Center. He was a participant in the March 5th, 1897 meeting to celebrate the memory of Frederick Douglass, which he founded the American Negro Academy led by Alexander Cromwell. Until the organization was discontinued in 1928, Miller remained one of the most active members of this first major African-American learned society, refuting racist scholarship, promoting black claims to individual social and political equality, and publishing early histories and sociological studies of African-American life. Miller gained his well-known national importance from his involvement in another movement led by W.E.B. Du Bois. He showed intellectual leadership during the conflict between accommodations of Booker T. Washington and the ra radicalism of the growing civil rights. Miller was known in two ways to the public. On an African-American education policy, Miller aligned himself with neither the radicals Du Bois and the Niagara movement, nor the conservatives, the, follow, the followers of Booker T. Washington. Miller saw a middle way, a comprehensive education system that would provide for symmetrical development of African American citizens by offering both vocational and intellectual instruction. In February 1929, Miller was elected chairman of the Negro Sahara. Sahindran, Sahindran, a civil rights conference held in Chicago that brought together representatives of 61 African-American organizations to forge closer ties and attempt to craft a common program for social and political reform. He believed that Blacks should favor free market rather than government or union power, stating, the capitalist has built one dominating motive, the production and sale of goods, the race or color of the producer counts but little. The capitalists stand for an open shop which gives to every man the unhindering, unhindered right to work according to his ability and skills. In this proposition, the capitalists and the Negro are as one. He was critically, he was critical of racially biased policing, saying in 1935 that police violent, harm community trust. Too often, the policeman's club is the only in instrument of the law with which the Negro comes into contact. This engenders in him a distrust and resentful attitude towards all public authorities and law officers. So it goes down talking about his written words. Uh, he was a prolific writer of articles and essays which were published in major newspaper, magazines, several books, including Out of the House of Bondage. Miller assisted W.E.B. Du Bois in editing The Crisis, the official journal of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Miller started off publishing his article anonymously in the Boston Transcript. He wrote about both radical and conservative groups. Miller also shared his views in the Educational Review, Dow Education, and the Journal of Social Science. His anonymous articles later became subject for his lead essay in his 
book, Race Adjustment, published in 1908. Miller suggests that African Americans had the right to protest against the unjust circumstances that came with the rise of white supremacy in the South. Miller supported racial harmony, thrift, and institution building. So in 1917, Miller published an open letter to President Woodrow Wilson in the Baltimore Afro-American against lynching, which he called national in its rage and scope and called the government's failure to stop it, the disgrace of democracy. He also stated it is but hollow mockery of the Negro when he is beaten and bruised in all parts of the nation and flees to the national government of Asylum to be denied relief on the basis of doubtful tradition. The black man asks for protection and is given a theory of government. It was circulated as a pamphlet in the camp libraries of the U.S. Armed Forces for about a year until the Department of Military Censorship ordered it removed because it tended to make the soldier who, re who read it a less effective fighter against the German. Miller published Kelly Miller's History of the World War for Human Rights, which included a wonderful array of striking pictures made from recent official photographs, illustrating and describing the new and awful devices used in the horrible methods of modern warfare, together with remarkable pictures of the Negro in action in both Army and Navy in 1919. So his death and legacy. After the First World War, Miller's life became difficult. He was demoted in 1919 to dean of a new junior college after J. Stanley Durkee was appointed as president of Howard in 1918 and built a new central administration. Miller continued to publish articles and weekly columns in black presses. His views were published in more than 100 newspapers. Miller died in 1939 on Howard's campus. He was survived by his wife, Annie May Butler, four of his five children, Kelly III, May, Irene, and Paul. His son, Isaac Newton, preceded him in death. A 160-unit a housing development in Leechoit Park, constructed in 1941, was named in his honor as was Kelly Miller Middle School in Washington, D.C. So here's the footnotes at the bottom if you guys want to read more into it. And also, here's the further reading. Here's the links and the external link at the very bottom. All right, so that's all the information about his biography. Now, I'm just going to share some more sources that you guys can look into. And also, I'm going to share some books that he has written as well. All right. Peace, brother. Peace, peace, peace. All right. So here's some more articles that can be found. right here this article i'm gonna uh, go ahead and zoom it up it's it called is called the thought and leadership of kelly miller the author is wd wright and it was written in Falun 1960 well no 1978 of course uh volume 39 number two it was published by clark Atlanta university okay so that's one article, and you can find this on www.jstor.org, which stands for JASTER. JASTER means journal storage. That is a peer review website, and also it's a scholarly review as well. So you can find all types of scholastic sources on that website. Uh, whatever you want to look for, you can get access to it, okay? It's right here. All right, so then I have another one that you guys can look into. Okay. 
This one comes from ASALA, which stands for Association of the Study of African American Life and History, the University of Chicago Press Journal. All right. Kelly Miller, the Negro leader as a marginal man. Arthur Bernard Eisenberg, the source is the Journal of Negro History, which was written in 1960. Okay, volume 45, number three. Published by the University of Chicago Press on the behalf of the Association of the Study of African American Life and History. And as you can see right here, you can see where the website again, www.jstor.org. All right, so, so um, I'm not going to go into that, but that's where you guys can find out more information. So it is very, it's peer review, it's, it's scholarly. So it's a reliable uh, website. So you can go on there, J stor.org which stands for journal storage okay. all right also uh these are the books that he had written regarding to regarding to the african-american life and history All right, so that's a picture of him again. And this book right here is called The World War for Human Rights. All right, so right here. This chapter one, and the first chapter goes like this. It says the world war terminated by the signing of the Armistice, November 11, 1918, was attended with more far reaching changes than any war known to history and is designated to be so profoundly influenced civilization that we see in it the beginning of a new age. Some what similar wars in the past were the campaigns of Alexander, the wars that overthrew the Roman Empire and the Napoleonic, the, the Napoleonic wars of a previous century. But this one war surpasses them all measured by any skills that can be applied to military operation. It was truly a world war, thus in a class by itself, beginning in Central Europe, 28 nations, nearly all of the important nations of the world, with a total population of about one, what's it, one billion and six hundred million or one twelfth of the human race became involved. It cost 10 million human lives, 17 million suffered more, more suffered bodily injury the money cost was about ooh dang, that's a lot of money it was about 200 billion but who can measure the cost in untold yeah who can measure the cost in untold suffering caused by ruined homes and wrecked lives that attended it or can measure the property loss considering that the various provenance of Europe were swept with the bison of destruction. And then he goes on to say, rightly to judge the real significance of such a world struggle, we must consider conditions that made it possible. Studying the issue involves strip of all misleading statements, review its course, and weigh the nature of the profound changes, geographical, political, and economic, that resulted. We shall find that this world, this war was the culmination of century old causes that two rival theories of government impossible to longer coexist met in deadly conflict that civilization itself was the stake at issue. We shall see that beyond the wreck of empires and troubled days of reconstruction now upon us, 
though it all approaches a wonderful new age auto or autocracy has crumbled a higher form of democracy will arise and in political excuse me and in peaceful days to come the nations of the world will rapidly advance in all that constitutes national well-being all right so he's giving his account on the world war and as you can see these are the pictures that was used from the uh the time that the u.s soldiers were serving in germany okay see so these are the pictures All right, so this can be found on Google, actually. Uh, so a lot of his books that he has written, anything that's pretty much outdated, Google would normally keep them. So you can download it and read it yourself on Google. All right, so the name of the book. Uh, the name of the book is called The World War for Human Rights. All right. Written by Kelly Middle. And I have two more. So this one is called Out of the House of Bunnage. out of the house of bondage and this one was written in 1914. all right so here's a poem it says a moral asinum which constitute the four as well as the final word of this volume i hate a cat the very sight of the feline form evokes my wrath whenever one goes across my path i shiver with extensive fright and yet there is a little kit i treat with tender kind kindliness the fondle pet of my darling best for i love her and she loves it in earth beneath as heaven above it satisfies the reasoning that those who love the self same thing must also must also want another love then if our father loved all mankind of every clime and hue who love him must love them too it cannot otherwise befall all right so this is the first chapter it says out of the bunnish out of the house of bunnish it says the story of the african on the american continent possesses both the painful reality of truth and the pleasing fascination of fiction. Although this history has been so frequently repeated as to become a wearisome recital, yet no sooner does the flagging public mind tire of the rehearsal than some accentuating feature demands it anew. This narrative will be will ever be fresh with parental interest not only because of the ever recurring dramatic incidents and episodes but because it motif touches the hidden springs of the deepest human solitude and passion the continued performance of this never-ending drama has already stretched through well high what well, I mean well night three centuries with not a hint of termination the emancipation problem may be regarded as the close of the first act the golden jubilee of this event justifies a moment's pause for a cursory glance at the past a glimpse of the present and if it might be vouch vouch vouchsafe an inkling of the future And then goes on to say, 
Three centuries ago, two streams of population began to flow to the newer from the older continents of the world. The European component was but the natural overflow of the foundation of civilization, while the African confluent was forced upward from the lowest level of savagery. The confluence of these two streams have constituted our present population of some hundred million souls divided into the approximate ratio of 10 to 1. Here we have the most gigantic instance in history of the hemispheric transference of population. The closest intimacy of contact of markedly dissimilar races gives the world its acutest and most interesting object lesson in race relationship. We are easily convinced that the whole movement must have been under the direction of a guiding hand higher than human intelligence or foresight. The deep cry unto the cry and the nations heard and heeded the cry, although they little understood its far-reaching meaning and import. The the Negro was introduced into his land by the European Lord of creation, not as a fellow creature, but as a thing apart, designated to a lower range and scoped by eternal and unalterable decree. This tertium quid was deemed a little more than animal and a, le a little less than human. All right, so... If you guys want to check out this book again, you can download it on Google. It's called Out of the House of Bondage. And what is the House of Bondage? Of course, when he say out of the house of bondage, he's talking about slavery. That's what he's talking about. All right. So Again, you guys can check that information out. You can go ahead and just type it up on Google and you can just download the PDF and you can read it for yourself. It's for free. All right. Then I have a last one. Um, this one is called Appeal to Conscious. An appeal to conscience. Chapter one it says race contact. The contact adjustment and attrition, attrition, excuse me. Yet the contact adjustment and attrition of the various races of mankind constitute the gravest problem of modern civilization. This problem is not limited by local or national boundaries, is not confined or I mean it's not confined to continental or hemispheric division of the earth's surface, but is worldwide in its scope and operation. The conflict of races is the dominating problem of Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, North and South America, and the scattered islands of the sea. Hmm. The political and economic issues which now threaten disruption of the foundation of social order on deeper analysis will be found to have their root in the deeper issue of race. In the United States, we have but an infinitesimal fraction of the universal race problem and yet the American Negro problem present certain unique and particular features which cause the students of social subjects to bestow upon it a degree of attention according to no other point of race contact throughout the globe. All right, so among these particular features may be mentioned, in the United States, we have the most gigantic instance in history where the, where the weaker race has been brought into the territory of the stronger as a 
servile element. The stronger race usually overruns the territory of the weaker, reduces it to sub suggestion and imposes upon the subdued people its lordly regimen. The Negro and the European represent widely divergent ethnic types. The experiment of adjusting markedly different races on terms of equality under a democratic institution is here being tried for the first time in the history of race relationships. The weaker element is greatly outnumbered by the stronger and is unevenly distributed over the geographical era. The numerical inferiority of the Negro rendered his presence less Meaningful in the judgment of the more populous and more powerful race, while his segregation in the South produces a state of unbalanced pressure of the public sentiment concerning his place and his in part in, in the general political and social scheme. The traditional attitude of the North and the South grows out of this unevenness of numerical distribution. All right, so, so again, of course, he's talking about uh, racism and um, and getting into the concept of how it has affected the uh, African American in that time period, and as far as like mentally and the behavior of African American and whatnot. So that's where he's really going into with that. Um, again, this was written in the 1900s. So if you guys are interested in looking into this, it's called An Appeal to Conscious. And you can find that on Google. All right, you can download it for free. All right, so that's all I have for today. And with that being said, Excuse me. With that being said, I hope you guys um, have a wonderful evening, and I hope you guys being safe. So for those that was uh, tuning in watching, I appreciate that. And if you want to share this channel, you're more than welcome. Make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell. And also, not only that, not only hit the notification bell, but also uh, like the channel if you like it. If you don't like it, give it a thumbs down. Hey, it's cool with me. You know, I don't be tripping off of that. But make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. Make sure you um make sure you share the contents though. And thank you for checking it out. All right. Until then, this your girl Tiffany, and I'm logging off. Peace.